Good morning, everybody. We are in uh, Genesis chapter 9, and we've got uh, two more sections of this, of the account, of the narrative of the, the flood account uh, to go. Uh, we wrapped up with uh, God's words uh, as after Noah's sacrifice in verses uh, 1 through 7 last time, and we'll pick up uh, there this morning. Uh, let's open with prayer. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to gather and study your word in likeness uh, by your Holy Spirit so that uh, our understanding of your word uh, might be uh, deepened, our faith in your Son, uh, Jesus, increased, and our love for one another grow. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 All right. Uh, just in case there are any uh, leftover questions from last week regarding these last words from um, verses 5 and so forth, for, uh, you, you remember uh, Noah is, is told, uh, incidentally, uh, in verse 1 of 9, Noah and his sons, so, so we have a, a blessing that's on Noah and his descendants, and uh, all the the yous, um, so for example, uh, as I gave you, but you shall not eat flesh, um, uh, you, your life, brother, that's going to continue in um, 7, 8, 9, so forth. It, it, it's, it's plural, it's y'all. Right? This isn't just to Noah, it's, it's to, to Noah and the, his posterity, the rest of the human race. And that's going to be very significant as we hear uh, of the, the covenant beginning in, in verse 8 that, that, that's coming. But uh, here, a, a ch there's first a, an echo of, of creation in the fact that he's told again, be fruitful to multiply. Uh, stewardship of, of the rest of creation is, uh, is given again. Uh, but but now every moving thing that lives shall be food for you in verse 3. And so that's both, uh, I guess, a positive thing insofar as now man has this new source of nutrition, but it's, it's a negative thing because it reminds us that that enmity between man and creation is still there as a consequence of the fall. So uh, man and the rest of living creation uh, will be at odds with one another. And then we have these uh, prohibitions. You, you're, you can shed the blood of animals, but can't eat it, can't consume it. And you can't shed the blood of humans at all. And so we have in verse... Um, Five, and for your lifeblood I will require a reckoning from every beast I will require it and for man from his fellow man I will require a reckoning for the life of man whoever sheds the blood of man by man shall his blood be shed for God made man in his own image and uh, I, I, the, the, the Roman Catholic position today is now that, that capital punishment is incompatible with the sanctity of life and here we find the Bible saying just the opposite. Capital punishment is established because of the sanctity of life. That, the, that there is no retribution or compensation commensurate with the taking of a life short of the taking of the life of the one who takes it. So, so we, we, we're, we're showing the, the value of life by requiring of the, the murderer his own. Um, so, so we just cannot say on, on biblical grounds that capital punishment is immoral. We might say in certain contexts, certain countries, it's impractical. But, but we can never say it's immoral. You, you, you follow me? It, uh, and you be fruitful and multiply, team on the earth and multiply in it. And so we, we've come back that's kind of framed by the be fruitful and multiply. Any questions about that? that? That was stuff we all covered last week together. But uh, any, any questions about, about that much before we move into the new rock? Um, from every beast I will require it. 
Yeah, if the, so an, the, if the animal, animal is responsible thing. for yeah the, the taking of, of a human life, yeah okay. that 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 animal also deserves to. I mean, what what do we do with pit bulls that bite the the, the mailman? <laughs> right. So they don't get off the hook. I'm just an animal. So does that does not sit well with you, Rob? Oh. Yeah. So I I had heard an interesting uh, take on the beast the, this beast situation. It is uh, like a, 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 an ox or an animal that gores somebody yeah. needs to be put down because it's indicative of the mistreatment of the owner and. Yeah, well, I mean, it was oh, oh, in terms of, all oh, right, if, if, if it's your bird, if it's your beast, then you then then yourself, the yeah, the owner, yeah, it, it's, yeah. he's it's your agent, you're them. the principal, yeah, <laughs> yeah, and, and I, I believe that is part of the Mosaic Law, yeah, yeah, that they're, yeah, tough, huh? <laughs> so, but uh, again, we have some of these things already in the days of Noah that will get reiterated and codified and there will be other penalties attached to, to various forms of harm to another that will get spelled out more specifically in the Mosaic Law. But, but what do we see over and over again? We see just, we have the, the most severe penalties attached to what is the most opposite of God, death. Right? You, know, you think of the clean-unclean distinctions. You know, what, what is the most obvious, easiest way to become unclean? It's by coming into contact with something that's dead. And why would that be? Because death is the opposite of what God wills for His creation. Uh, so, so built into the Mosaic Law are all these ways in which the people are being reminded again and again, things are not as they were meant to be. That what, what do we say? Two sure things in this life: death and taxes. <laughs> but but the the Mosaic law is such a way that okay, as as predictable and commonplace as death is, let's never forget this was not the way he originally made it. And so the, those those reminders are built into the the life that Israel was called to live, with things as strange to us as this requirement. Right, that, that the owner is, is liable for the death caused by his own animal. Or, or how about the whole business of um, you shall not mix um, uh, uh, a dead goat with, with its mother's milk. Right? That, that seems odd, to say the least. But if, if you think of the big picture, see, why would that be so abhorrent to God? Because it's a, a mixing of, of two things that could not be more opposite. What is the purpose of the mother's milk? To, to, to sustain life. And now we're mixing something that's dead with it. You don't do that. Yeah. Okay. Any, anything else? Had that been a common practice? Why would you need a law against something that wasn't? Right, yeah, and and who knows? Did 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 this ever happen? Right, uh, you got laws against polyester as well. You know that happens. Just open my closet. Uh, <laughs> um, but but would it have happened? Maybe, yeah. Maybe for 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 cooking. I don't know. Uh, I don't have any old uh, ancient Israelite uh, recipes, uh, but there, there better not be one that calls for <laughs> uh, one skinless goat, uh, two cups of its mother's milk. You just play goats. What? Uh, yeah, I don't know. Because I've read it, I think it only says goats. Yeah, it's only, it's only, yeah, it's only uh, yeah. that's right. Yeah. <clears throat> But you, you would think that the spirit of the law would, would, would be such that you wouldn't uh, do it with any animals. Uh, and, it, and it's it's mother's milk. But, all right. But, but hey, this is Genesis 9, not uh, okay. Leviticus uh, 18 or whatever. Uh, moving into uh, verse 8. And let's see. I want to go. Um, I can 
can't read my own handwriting. Yeah, let's let's do eight, nine, ten, eleven. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him. And, and now again, 9, 10, and 11, all the, every time you see the word you, it's plural. Behold, I establish my covenant with you and your offspring after you, with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the livestock, and every beast of the earth with you, as many as came out of the ark. It is for every beast of the earth. I establish my covenant with you that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. Notice how emphatic the style is. Uh, that that he lists everybody. You, your offspring after you, the birds, the livestock, every beast of, of the earth with you, as many as came out of the ark, every beast of the earth. Um, and uh, then we, we, we get, here's the covenant. I establish my covenant with you that never again shall all flesh, so all living things, be cut off by the waters of the flood. Never again uh, shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. And uh, this matter of covenant is so important for all of the body. This is, this is the first uh, covenant uh, we see recorded in, in scripture. And I, I suppose the word covenant has become kind of a, a Bible-ish word. Uh, it, 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 it's a word, you if you ever hear it, you, you hear it in the context of church reading the Bible. And yet we do know of extra biblical covenant. You know, what, what are some examples of where covenant shows up outside of covenant? Uh, a church context oh, real estate real estate right uh, a house can have a covenant on it or a neighborhood that has a covenant on it that certain rules that, that that aren't to be broken regarding the uh, use of the uh, of, of the of the land uh, was one, one of not here but one, one of our members uh, for, for much of his career managed trusts for people. And so a lot of that work involved investigating the covenant language in the, 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 the titles of the property and things like that. And of course, the law has stepped in since uh, uh, days long ago to uh, strike down certain racist, discriminatory covenants that have attached to uh, buildings that are that old or you know, that you can't sit, sell this house to someone of this race. And you know, that, that's a covenant, alas. But, uh, uh, our law doesn't honor those anymore, which is a good thing, but those are covenants. Now, when we think of a covenant, what, what, what do we think of? What, what, what is a, a covenant, generally speaking? A contract. A contract. And what, what makes it a contract? Four parties. We got two parties mutually agreeing to it. So uh, if you do this, I will do this. And if you don't do this, then I won't reciprocate or, or, or fulfill my end of the, of the covenant. And uh, while we do see sometimes in the Bible covenants like that, and it's certainly true that all covenants in the Bible involve two parties, the primary kind of covenant in the Bible is a one-sided promise. And the very first one is just such a covenant. You notice there are no conditions on this promise that God makes never to destroy the earth again by a flood. He doesn't say, you know, so long as you keep up your end of the bargain, so long as you get your act together and keep it together, I won't do this. But if you don't, watch out. No, nope, it's just a, a, a flat, absolute promise that God is not going to do this no matter what. And um, it's interesting in, uh, how, how can I ask this without giving away the answer? In, in those books, uh, Matthew to Revelation, the Greek word used to translate the word covenant from the Old Testament is... 
testament. Testament. And what about a testament? What, what makes, see, this, this is actually more accurate than, than that word covenant. It, it's the same word that you're going to find in other cultures besides the ancient Israelite culture to describe a, a contract or a, a treaty, uh, an agreement between, say, the, the chieftain or the, the, the head and, and, and the people he rules, the people he governs, or between two people uh, working for each other or building something together, what, what it would have you. Covenant, that same word being used here. But to translate it in, with the word in Greek that means testament, that captures that one-sidedness of these covenants that God makes throughout the Old Testament. So in the book of Hebrews, over and over again, I want to talk about the, the old covenant, which is the Mosaic covenant, which is actually more like a contract. But it's going to translate a testament and say that old one's been replaced by this new one, and the new one is in what? So Jesus, but specifically his, his blood, his blood. In fact, the only time the New Testament itself, you get the sticker, Rose. <laughs> you earned it. But in the New Testament itself, I love pointing this out. The only time the phrase New Testament itself is used is to refer to the Lord's Supper. Right? We think of the New Testament as that collection of books from Matthew to Revelation. But those books themselves, within them, Use New Testament always to be a reference to the Lord's Supper, the sacrament of the altar, the New Testament in my blood. Um, so um, in, in this case, I've already told you the answer, but it, it, we just read it. I establish my covenant with you that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood. Never again shall there be a flood to destroy uh, the earth. Is does this? Are we dealing with the treaty here or are we dealing with the testament? Yeah. Oh, and, and outside the Bible, where do we hear testament? Last will and, Last will and testament. testament. And so what about that better captures what's going on here than the word covenant? Even, even in kind of a, a, everyday use. What, what happens in a last will and testament? Staying out with your desires, your wills, your promises. Yeah, yeah, the, the, the person is just stating, this is my the desire for my heirs, that, you know, so-and-so get the house, so-and-so uh, gets, you know, this amount of the estate, you know, the church gets this much. Please <laughs> um, but, but it's a gifting. See, the, the testament is a gifting. And, and I can remember, I, I, I still contend, this is the reason God had me go to law school for one year, was to leave with this one analogy. See, it, it hit me. Uh, first year, you, you, you take the, the, the five basic classes. You take contracts. You take property, criminal, uh, criminal law, civil procedure, and torts. Right? Delicious. <laughs> I always left hungry after that class. <laughs> Talking about torts for an hour, and how can you not go to the baby after that? Um, so very early on, the it was the contracts class that the, the question is asked: How does a judge know he's dealing with something that falls under what we're studying in this class, namely contract law? And not some, and, and it, rather than something that belongs in another class you're taking, property laws. And, 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 and well, you haven't, do we have any lawyers in the, in the room? Mm -hmm. Is it two sides agreeing? Yeah, it's two sides. The, the fancy legal word is consideration. Yeah, right. Consideration, which is that bargain for exchange, that's a necessary element to a contract. It's not there. With, with, with gifts or inheritance and, and, and primarily property law, where in, in a last will and testament, you're simply giving the thing to the person by, by, because that person is your son or uh, your spouse, the, the, the beneficiaries and so forth. 
And that makes all the difference in the world, even though the language itself might sound very similar. That, that the, the, the thing gifted in the, the will and testament can very much be seen as a kind of reward that's being received by the heir. And yet, because there's not a bargain for exchange, it's not treated as a contract. There's not a condition that the heir has to meet in order to receive the land that's bequeathed to him in the testament. And that, 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 that set off alarm bells for me in that there are times when our salvation is talked about in terms of a reward in the New Testament. But as Melanchthon, Luther's right-hand man at Wittenberg, would always point out, but it's always in the context of, 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 of a testament. Of, of an inheritance. You see, it's property law, not contract law. So, so even our faith, right? We're not being rewarded for our faith, right? Faith is simply trusting in the promise that God makes to us unconditionally. And say, so long as you believe, you get this, as though we're, we're, if we believe enough, we'll get it, right? No, no, it's the fact he's already made the promise to us that activates our trust in it. And therefore, it's a it's a, a trusting in the testament, not a not a doing something to meet the demands of the contract. Yeah, yeah. I'm just curious, is there a reason then why the why we always translate the Old Testament as covenant instead of as testament when it is these promises that are all on I mean, God's side? Yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah, it, it's because I mean that is the Hebrew word, and there's nothing set in stone that says the covenant has to involve conditions on both sides, right? What, what makes it a covenant is you've got something being exchanged, something being given from one party to another, right? But it just so happens that so many of the covenants in the Old Testament are, strictly speaking, one-sided. There's no, here's what I'll do in exchange for what, what you'll do. Now that will come up with Moses, in a sense. Uh, but but then good of the of, of the New Testament trant writers to take that word and, and see it as as truly a, a testament. Yeah, yeah. I, but, but that's a good question. I don't know, except maybe the Hebrew culture wasn't sophisticated enough to have a separate word for for the two things. Not to put as fine a point on it as the you know the Greeks are always doing, putting a finer point on things. It's true. <laughs> Um, so, but, but for us rightly to recognize that the first time covenant shows up in the Bible, it, it is, a, it is a, a, a promise that God makes without requiring anything on the part of the, uh, the people that benefit from it. In, in other words, it, it, it's not like God's doing this because he's kind of, his hand has been forced. <laughs> it's not like he's run out of water. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I will never do this again because as it turns out, I don't have any more water to do it again with. <laughs> no, he could. He, he absolutely could, but he chooses not to and pledges never to do it again. And he doesn't do so on the basis of, well, you know, now everything's hunky-dory. You know, now that I've gotten rid of all the sinners, it, it, it's going to be fine from here on. So I, I won't need to do it again. No, no, even though the, the, the same sin that was there before the flood is there after the flood, he is not going to do this again. And, and it has nothing to do, it doesn't even have to do, there, there's no mention of the sacrifice that no, he doesn't say, because you sacrificed to me, Noah, I will reward you by never flooding you or anybody after you. Nope, it, it's just out of, out of the blue, completely out of God's own goodness that he does this. Noah's sacrifice itself was a, a thanksgiving for something God had already done, namely saved him from the flood. And, and that's always a, a good reminder of our own worship, that Christian worship is W-shaped, not M-shaped. That is to say, when, when we gather as God's people, we come not to, to give God stuff, Right to, 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 to praise him in order that he might then respond by giving us some good stuff back. No, no, no. We come first to receive. God's giving first. He comes down to us with his good gifts, forgiving our sins, announcing uh, the absolution, uh, reiterating the gospel, coming to us 
uh, in, this, in the, the Lord's Supper with, with Christ's own body and blood for our forgiveness. And then th there's, there's this rhythm of he gives to us and then we respond with thanksgiving and praise. And then he gives us some more. And then we respond with thanksgiving and praise. Um, this is the world's way of worship. The, the, the world uh, appears before God as though it's got something that God needs from us. And we, we, we know better than that. No, no, no. Everything we have, it starts with God giving us something first. And so that, in a way, is also an echo of creation, isn't it? See, Adam and Eve come at the end of God's act of creating. So that God puts all these gifts together and then creates the person to receive them. And, and, and so it is now that we're starting over, as it were, with Noah and his descendants, okay, He's got this, this new world that's been wiped clean of, of, of all these evil doers, a, a new start. Creation has been rejuvenated, refreshed. God did that. God did that first. And, and only after that does, does Noah respond with an offer, a, thanks, a, a thank offering. And, um, and so on top of that, God makes this promise that has nothing to do with anything man has done or anything that man will do to ensure that he keeps the promise, he just makes a promise and, and we'll, we'll, we'll never break it. Um, so any, any questions about that before we move into the next next verses? Yeah, yeah, Dennis. Uh, I feel like I should take consolation of the fact that uh, he's not going to flood the world again. I hope he forgives me for this, but I don't take much consolation when God can do it 100,000 different ways. If he takes away one way, yeah. that, that's right. Yeah, if, if not by water, and, and it, it, it seems we'll, we'll get the text today, won't we? Yeah. That uh, he's not going to go with water, he's going to go with fire next time, right? right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so uh, fire is next time, right? So, but the, 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 the water was a, an, an extremely bad way to go, so I, I think we should still be thinking, Dennis, you should still be thinking. Okay. <laughs> I mean, one out of four has been eliminated. That's right. Yeah, exactly. Right? Going back to an old 60s band. Perfect. No. What were the elements again? Uh, but don't forget the fifth element. Love. No. Uh, spoiler alert. That's, uh, that's the Bruce Willis movie. Spoiler for you. Fifth element is love. All right. <laughs> oh, Scott Booker gets that. Bruce Willis is a cab driver in the future. So. Okay. Uh, verse 12. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that's with you for all future generations. I have set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant that I've established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. Okay, so again, very emphatic style. <laughs> uh, question, in those verses, a little homework for you, how many times do we hear the word between? Sarah, is there a book where it says five? Do, do I hear more or less than five? Fewer than five? Sounds like a number. I think 12 to 17. Matt says six. Well, you beat me. I, I think it's six. Okay, back, back to five. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there, there, there are five betweens. See? 
Uh, so in verse 12, we've got between me and you and every living creature. Uh, verse 13, covenant between me and the earth. Um, 15, between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. Uh, 16, the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that's on the earth. And then in 17, between me and all flesh that's on the earth. So five times God talks about the covenant made between him and not just Noah, not just Noah and his family, but between him and all creation. Whoa. <clears throat> so th th that's also obviously a, a, an echo of the, the, the creation account from the beginning, <laughs> that, that, that God still loves that creation that he made in Genesis chapters one and two, uh, despite it now being corrupted by sin. And so now this, this promise never to flood it again so that it's destroyed is made between him and all of creation. Very big deal. Um, and with the covenant, we have a sign. This is, this is pretty universal in, in the Bible, that, that when a covenant is made between God and someone else, a sign is attached to it. In this case, the sign is the bow, the bow in the cloud. Um, I alluded last week to, to the fact that, that some of the early church fathers even at, at least made, made this point about the, the setting of the bow in the cloud. And that is, again, it's, it's the same word. It's, it's not, there's not a different word for rainbow than there is for a war bow. <laughs> same word. So everywhere you see uh, talk, talk of the, uh, the, the warrior's bow and arrow, it's the same word here for what, what we know as the, the rainbow. And that the, the picture this gives us is as it were, of God hanging up his weapon. I'd say, uh, you know, if, if, if any of you have a, uh, you, know, you know, someone in the family who's got some, I don't know, uh, uh, World War II rifle or some kind of, of, of weapon from, from an ancient war that, you know, hanging on the, on the wall, right? You know, it, it, it's, it's kind of like that. It, you, you, you go into that guy's office and uh, these, these weapons that would otherwise scare you, right, if they were pointed at you, aren't pointed at you, they're hanging on the wall. And, and so here with the bow, God has, has hung it up, right? And, and for us, every time we see a rainbow, not to think first and foremost, oh, let's go find the gold at the end of it. Or... Uh, there's unicorns out there, or, or, or even how beautiful it is, which it is, right? But, but think primarily, this is God's promise to his creation, not to destroy it again. In fact, it's a sign of God's love for his creation. That's what we ought to think of when we see the rainbow. Um, also, he loves color. And he loves color. Yes. So, um, but but the text itself tells us what, what the bow is the sign of. And uh, says nothing about love of color. But I say. But Rose says it. Rose chapter 4, verse 19. Um, so, the... the, uh, the the sign or, or the, uh, the foreshadowing of other covenants that this is. Think about, once again, the book of Genesis, it's written, especially these, these first 11 chapters are kind of the preamble, the, 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 the whereases that, that, that set up the, the main body of the rest of the Torah, which is centered around God delivering his people out of Egypt, bringing them to, to Sinai and, and giving them this, this new life as his people uh, that, that involves these laws that, that Moses is, is given. Um, well, 
what, what is the, the sign of the covenant with, with, with Moses and, and Israel? Actually, not no, that's earlier. That's, we, we've skipped over one. We'll come back to that, but that, that's a good one. Don't want to forget that one. But, but this one in particular has an element that's also involved in the one that will come with Moses. The bow is in the what? I heard it. In the cloud. How does God make his presence known among his ancient people? In the cloud. Follows them by a cloud, cloud by day and smoke by night. Fire by night, right? Um, so, and in that particular covenant, which is it unlike this one, because what have you just had a lot of, to say the least, in the blood itself? You have had the shedding of blood. You will have the shedding of blood again in, in the Mosaic covenant, and the blood will be sprinkled on the people and on the altar, right? Uh, so, so we've got we've got blood, the shedding of blood, sealing the the, the, the covenant. Uh, the cloud as, as God's presence being a sign of it. Uh, the, 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 the codes of the covenant itself, which the people are to keep as a sign of the covenant. So this continual animal sacrifice will, will be a sign of, of God's special relationship with this particular people on the earth. That's all there. We, we had another covenant mentioned covenant even before that with Abraham and what was the sign of that circumcision so so think we, we've got in this case a covenant with everybody everything all of creation and the bow is the sign of it the bow and the cloud you get to Abraham and you've got a covenant with him as the head of one particular people group and the sign of it is circumcision we've got spilling of blood is but just a little, but his own. And then you get covenant with Israel, covenant made again with one special people group, and it's also signed by shedding of blood, but it's alien blood. It's not the people's own blood that they had to shed for their sins. They get an animal substitute for their sins that the, the blood is the substitute of. And now we get to the ultimate covenant, which is Christ in his blood. And all three of these previous covenants get pulled together in Jesus. How so? Jesus sheds his blood, which is other blood, not our own. It's the blood of the Son of God. And yet it's his own blood. And it sets up and establishes a covenant with everybody not just the descendants of Abraham. Pretty cool, huh? Yeah, so the covenant with Noah, the covenant with Abraham, the covenant with Moses, all of those covenants find their ultimate fulfillment in the, in the one covenant in Jesus' blood shed for us on the cross. Um, let's see, what else? Um, Yeah, I think that's, any questions about that before we change directions abruptly with the next episode? Please, please ask questions. I would rather not get to this section. <laughs> Thank you, Trisha. <laughs> Feel free to speak slowly. Okay. <laughs> The, the covenant was to, to Abraham's descendants, but also they were supposed to be witnesses to those outside. Yeah, outside, and right? I remember the so promise to Abraham is that through his seed, where, where does that go back to? Goes back to Genesis chapter three. All nations will be blessed. That's right. That's right. So so Abraham. So it wasn't cutting off anybody else. That that's exactly right. Or not intended to. Not in, yeah, exactly exactly through one of his descendants. All nations would be blessed. And so, uh, but, but for all that time, that people group uniquely had that promise. We were custodians of the promise 
the beneficiaries of which were everybody, not just not just the Jews or the descendants of Abraham. Yeah, as as you know, Paul, as as we all who have been to eight o'clock service, he really lays it on thick in chapter fifteen of Romans. Let's see, is it chapter yeah fifteen where he's just just trotting out? It's it's just verse after verse after verse from the Old Testament where. It's, it's the Gentiles that will get this too. The Gentiles will be saved. All, all, all the nations, all the Gentiles, over and over and over again. Right? All those verses that, that the Pharisees forgot or you know, tore out of the Bibles for some reason. Pastor, real quick. In the recording of your very first class, you <laughs> oh, there. a YouTube video. So yeah, 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 yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. Watching that led my YouTube feed to another. I don't know, you know that show <laughs> yeah. the parallels of the creation story and the promises there, right? With, with the promises to Noah. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Have you gone over that? I've missed. Well, you know what? We, we can definitely do that with the next section. Okay. Yeah, but but that see, we've got. <laughs> I'm trying to help you start. It, it, it's thank you. I, I'm so <laughs> so I'm so well, let me take 20 minutes to address that. Which <laughs> one? <laughs> <laughs> But so God has provided a new earth for Noah. You know, he steps out onto the new earth just as Adam and Eve were, were just given this garden that was waiting for them uh, at, at the end of the creation account. Uh, we have just as Adam is the head of the human race, Noah is now the head of the, the new human race after the flood. So in both ways, they are types of Christ. Who is the second Adam? See, Noah is a, a second Adam, which which Christ is. Christ is the second Adam. He gets right what Adam got wrong. Um, we, we, we've seen how so much of the language that God speaks to Adam and Eve is also spoken to Noah. Be fruitful and multiply. Team the earth. He, he, of course, takes account of sin now. It, it will be done now with, with uh, difficulty. But man is still to exercise stewardship, dominion over the creation. All, all, all of those things get reiterated in, in this chapter 9 uh, of a, after the flood. To make just that point that we've got kind of creation 2.0 yeah, with, with Noah uh, and his family. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the love that God has for his creation is, is, is all over the place just as it is all over the place in Genesis chapters uh, one and two. So all those things, yeah, are, are, are very important. All right, let, let's, we'll, 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 we'll tackle it after all. Uh, beginning in verse 18, the sons of Noah who went forth from the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Ham was the father of Canaan. These three were the sons of Noah, and from these the people of the whole earth were dispersed. <coughs> Noah began to be a man of the soil, and he planted a vineyard. He drank of the wine and became drunk and lay uncovered in his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. Then Shem and Japheth took a garment, laid it on both their shoulders, and walked backward and covered the nakedness of their father. Their faces were turned backward and they did not see their father's nakedness. When Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his youngest son had done to him, he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be to his brothers. He also said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge Japheth, and let him dwell in the tents of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. After the flood, Noah lived 350 years. All the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died. All right. Uh, Bruce uh, prompts me to, to ask, I think, a very helpful question here, and that is, just that section, what, what are some things that um, remind you of things that have happened in the previous chapters of Genesis, or, or similar to? There are a lot. Man of the soil. To... Man of the soil. Okay, what, what about that? What does that remind you of? Excuse me. All right, Cain is going to be a man of the soil. What else, though? Nakedness. I mean, if he's a man of the soil, what is he? Farmer. Okay, so just as Cain was, right? And I guess Adam was forced to be after the fall. What else? 
curse. All right, we've got a curse. Okay, but, but the curse is similar and different. This is a, another first in the Bible. You know what, what, what makes it a first? Dishonoring his father. They're so good. About the curse specifically. It's a person person. Yes. Mm -hmm. The curses we've seen so far, God has done the cursing. This is the first time we see a man curse another man. What else? The servitude. The, 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 the previous curses have been difficulties upon them or blessings upon them, but not actually making one subset. Yeah, together. right. Yeah, that, that's true. That, that's, that's new as well. Yep. Yep. But how about things that are similar to things that we've seen before? Yeah, I, I could have added to the discussion about the the whoever sheds the blood of man by man shall his blood be shed. That that in Luther wasn't the first to suggest this, but that that is really the instituting of government. No, no, no it's not a joke. Well, what's so funny about that? <laughs> but 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 no, you, you didn't you didn't require government before this, but now now you have a you have. Governing authorities that have the, 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 the power of the sword, right? So as to enforce the order that, that God wants for his creation. But, but back to, to 18 to, to 28, what, what else do we hear in those verses that reminds us of things that have come before? But we'll, we'll, how about verse 20? We've talked about him being a farmer. What about the next half of that verse? What about Adam and Eve in the garden, and they were naked. But they All right, we've got nakedness. God. Yes, absolutely. Yes, <laughs> very, very big. And they were ashamed. Yes. What else? What, what about he planted a vineyard? What does that sound like? Remind you of? Yeah, see, okay, Adam is the first gardener. He's given to garden. But even before that, what happened? What did God do? God walked with them in the garden. He planted a garden. Yes, he did. So God plants a garden in, in, in the account of creation. Here's Noah being godlike, as it were, planting a vineyard. Yeah? Why, did, why does it say he's the first tiller? If, if we were saying that Cain was also man, so why, why are they saying he's the first tiller of the soil? He was a man of the soil. Yeah. At least this version of what we read here says first tiller of the soil. In verse in verse twenty. Yeah. Oh, that's that's interesting. I mean, that would make it seem like before there was a garden that maybe was kept. Whereas this is the first time there was. Yeah. Broken. Notice in 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 my footnote. The, 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 an alternative way to read the Hebrew would be Noah, a man of the soil, was the first to plant a vineyard. Maybe that. Yeah, I've never heard that. That I, I, I could look that up. That's that strange. That they put first in front of tiller of the soil. This is an idea. Not not in front of planting a vineyard. RSV. RSV does that. Well, that's the Pinko Kami translation. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Erase that, yeah. Delete that app immediately. Uh, you're going to want to pull it from the cloud as well. Uh, if you sure the Lord returned today, you don't want to have that down on your phone. Um, uh, I, I, I will pursue that and, and, and see what the, the RSV folks are up to. You know, you know the RSV translation. Uh, won't uh, you know massages the the Isaiah promise of a virgin birth, so so as to not lead anyone to think that 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 uh, Isaiah knew ahead of time that Jesus would be born of a virgin, right? So th th there's an agenda with their translation. So anyway, um, I I think we've we've captured quite a uh, most of 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 the the echoes of the creation account 
but but I, I think the, the the largest point is this that in in so much of 18 to 28 we we see um as it were a reenactment uh uh here we go again it, it's genesis 3 all over again it's another fall, right? We've been told up to this point, Noah walked with the Lord. He was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. And this definitely falls in the didn't see that coming category. To, to see Noah fall like this, although the, you know, the, the greater sin you know, for, from a certain standpoint, it, it isn't, Noah isn't getting drunk, although it should be said at this point, drunkenness is a sin. Don't get drunk, people. Uh, the Bible makes it clear everywhere else that, that drunkenness, uh, we ought to know this as Christians because one of the uh, part of the fruit of the spirit is self-control. So drunkenness is the opposite of self-control. Um, but it's interesting that the text doesn't portray the drunkenness so much as the problem. Not that it isn't. But what? The behavior from drunkenness. Nakedness. Yeah, the, the nakedness, and not even the nakedness per se, but what? The sun exposing, the sun exposing it. Making fun. Yeah. So, so why might this be such a big deal? Disobedience to the father. Of the father. Okay. Yeah, I call it that. But 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 let's we, we got we got the nakedness thing going on. What, what what's the problem with with the nakedness to begin with? This is just like you said, or she said earlier, said earlier, like a repeat of Genesis, the right. part where Adam and Eve were exposed. Yes. Um, but then also, I mean, we were just talking about later down the chapter, but he's clothed again by his son. Yes. Right. So, so what do we learn from Genesis three and the nakedness of Adam and Eve that help us understand what's wrong here with Noah and his son? God clothed them. Yes. With nakedness human, comes with nakedness comes shame. shame. See, it, it, it's shameful to be naked, and and I think this is something we all know naturally. Fair enough. E e e even the most <laughs> um, scantily clad Aboriginal tribes wear something, typically. Uh, you know, e e even in, in, in very warm tropical climates, the women may be topless, but they still cover their lower parts, and the men do too. Or, or you read accounts of uh, British and American ships, you know, in the South Pacific. And they'll, they'll, they'll come to an island, and uh, the, the the chief will make the women put coconut shells to cover their their whatever's up there, um, <laughs> lest they be exposed to the white man. You see, so but but that's not that's not coming from. Oh wait, don't don't forget what was said in Genesis chapter nine or Genesis chapter three. It's it's natural. It's a, don't, don't, don't you parents find that your your children develop a sense of shame with regard to their own nakedness at a, at a certain point? You know, nine, ten, eleven, somewhere in there. Uh, Rose is thinking, oh, "Well, not my son." To this day, so so there's that. With the nakedness comes the shame, and now we get a better appreciation of what makes what Ham did so wrong. What does Ham do with regard to seeing his father's nakedness? See, it's not even seeing the nakedness that gets him in trouble. He tells. He, tells. he goes and tells his brother, his brothers. And so Rose brought up honor your father and your mother. Yes, that's in play here. But what else is in play of the commandments in terms of what this represents a, a trespass against? Your neighbor. Yes, but can we think of a, your father and mother or your neighbor too? Right. But but what besides the fourth commandment honor your father and mother, what else is going on here? His father is in an embarrassing, shameful situation. Bearing false witness. Bearing false witness. This is an eighth commandment problem too. 
instead of covering his brother's shame and covering his father's shame, he exposes it. He makes it a source of amusement and gossip. Yeah, which is good. not bad. So the, the two other brothers, they do the godlike thing, which is to cover their father's shame, which is what God did with Adam and Eve in their nakedness, their shame. This is why to this day, if a, if, if a pastor, upon hearing a member's confession, were to make those sins known to anyone else, he, he would immediately be defrocked and rightly so. The pastor's job is to cover sins, not, not expose them, not, 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 not gossip and, 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 and spread them around. You see, and, 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 and individual Christians, that's, that also ought to be our mindset, that when we see a brother, you know, not, not literally stand. naked, but, but, but in, in, in an embarrassing or a shameful situation, we go to that one alone and deal with it that way. We don't sort of, ha ha, boy, do I have a, a juicy story to tell you about so-and-so. Yeah. Yes. I just find this all super fascinating. I'm actually writing a paper this week on uh, loyalty to kin and the term kin in the Old Testament. Which oh my oh that's so good k i n so yes oh this is so good because kin it has such a broader um understanding in both the old and new testament that we you know kin is just your blood relative to, yeah, today. So it's today yes. yeah but, but, but kin they yeah, see friendship encompasses kinship yes. yeah and so when when jesus says i call you my friends we don't appreciate just how comforting a promise that is because friend is just it's a it's a guy you like his pictures on facebook uh right but also uh, the just the you were talking about the covering of shame this was a very important aspect that was obviously encouraged all throughout the bible yeah but god continually reminded them don't expose your family don't expose those that are close to you right. and then that's in the new testament as you were just saying when you hear a <coughs> You keep that in the family. Yeah. You take that, care of the family. Cool. Don't take it outside the family and right. expose them. But yeah, it's yeah. just that very beautiful aspect of family being somebody you count on, yes. someone that's always there that protects you, that that's not going to expose you. Right. Like, by exposing you, they're actually exposing themselves to shame. In a yes. Sense. So yeah, it's yeah. Yeah. Like no, how this all neat. ties in. <laughs> yeah. Wonderful. Beautiful. All right, well, we'll, we'll, we'll pick up there uh, next week, and uh, we'll get into that exciting chapter 10. <laughs> it's like 50 Hebrew names. Uh, I don't think it will take long to, to discuss that. Uh, and and uh, Pastor Gamaro uh, already connected 10 uh, to 11 when he was here a couple of weeks ago, and, and how... Uh, uh, you know, the, the whole business about the 70, right? That we get 70 generations in 10 and um, uh, you know, the sending of the 70 later with, with Jesus. Can you dig it? <laughs> uh, saved it for this week. I, I should have said it last week. Let's close in prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, uh, we thank you for your great one-sided unconditional promises to us. First, never to destroy the world again by a flood, but your great promise to all of us in Jesus that our sins have been covered by his blood and that through him we have forgiveness, life, and salvation. Uh, help us now, those of us going into uh, the second service, to, to hear your word and by it be strengthened in our faith and bless all of us as we go out and serve you in our various callings that through the work that you've given us to do, we might bear witness to your great love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Pastor, always remember God.